Welcome to the latest installment of our Ecoflora virtual seminar series. My name is Leah Paradiso and I'm a doctoral student at the New York Botanical Garden and a graduate fellow with the New York City Ecoflora Project. The Ecoflora Project was first started at NYBG back in 2017 with a grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Ecoflora is a community science project that has three main goals, to investigate urban ecosystems and urbanization, to support open source biodiversity data, and to increase understanding and appreciation of plant life. To date, over 30,000 observers have made almost 900,000 observations of plants and uh, their biotic partners in New York City and posted them to iNaturalist. About 60% of these 900,000 are of plants and fungi, while the remaining 40% are organisms like insects and animals that are pollinators, seed dispersers, and more. You can explore those, all these observations on our project page on iNaturalist, which I'm going to link in the chat right now. Each month, we also sponsor an EcoQuest challenge, which encourages New Yorkers to observe a particular species, a group of plants, or an interaction, and post those on iNaturalist. Our January EcoQuest is entitled Beginning the Year with Basidiomycetes. Uh, Basidiomycota is a large class of fungi that includes more than 31,000 known species. Uh, and there's several hundred that have been observed in New York City. Uh, so far this month, we've had uh, 113 observers make 702 observations of at least 108 different species. Uh, and you can also check out those on the project page for that. To go along with this EcoQuest, we will be co-hosting a fungal foray with the New York Mycological Society uh, this Sunday at Alley Pond Park in Queens. More information will be uh, sent out to our mailing list uh, probably tomorrow. Uh, so if you're not already on our mailing list, you can sign up here to get more information about that walk coming up and all of our future events, virtual and in person. All right, so with those that quick announcement, I we now will get into what we're here for tonight, and I'll turn it over to Tomi to do our introduction. I would like to start this seminar off like every other seminar with a land acknowledgement. Um, so I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement by recognizing the original people of this land, the Lenape, as well as their deep connection to the Lenape Home King homeland. As an organization dedicated to advocating for the more than human world, we must also acknowledge those who are original stewards of the land. We believe in the importance of acknowledging the settler colonial genocide perpetrated against the indigenous communities, as well as the resilience of the Lenape, who still today continue to resist erasure. Awesome. Okay, so for our speaker tonight, um, our speaker tonight is going to be Lindsay Campbell, a research social scientist with the USDA Forest Service, a Northern Research Station based in New York City Urban Field Station. Her research explores the dynamics of environmental governance, civic engagement, and natural resource stewardship. She is co-lead of StuMap, which maps the social networks and spatial territories of environmental stewardship groups. In addition to her research, Lindsay co-leads the Urban Field Station Collaborative Arts Program. Dr. Campbell holds a BA in Public Policy from Princeton University, a Master's in City Planning from MIT, and a PhD in Geography from Rutgers University. Tonight, Lindsay will talk to us about the citywide social assessment of New York City parks and natural areas. Um, please feel free to enter any questions or comments into the chat as we go. At the conclusion of the talk, we will be going through as many questions as we are able. If you have a question or comment that you would like to ask verbally at the end of the talk, you can use the raise hand feature or note in the chat that, and you will have the opportunity to do so. Also, if you're able to, unable to stay for the whole talk or you would like to share it with others, a recording will be posted to our YouTube page where you can find recordings of other past talks. Just note, we will be transferring all of our content to the main NYBG YouTube channel in the near future. Um, so, without further ado, here is Lindsay. Great. Thank you so much for the introduction and for the chance to speak. Well, I'm excited to be speaking to the NYBG and the Ecoflora because I know that your community includes um, many keen observers of New York City's landscape um, and social ecological system. and. While maybe you often train your eye on the plants and insect life, um, I'll be talking about a methodology and some results for 
how we might read the landscape for the human use value and meaning. So it's what we call a social assessment. Um, and I'm presenting on behalf of my colleagues and co-authors who are named here. We do very much a team science approach here at the field station. So just really quick, if you haven't heard of the New York City Urban Field Station, uh, we are a partnership between researchers at the US Forest Service, land managers at New York City Parks, um, nonprofits like the Natural Areas Conservancy, but also a wider constellation of universities and stewardship groups citywide. Um, our sort of de facto mission is here on the so slide. We seek to improve the quality of life in urban areas by conducting, communicating, and supporting research about social ecological systems and natural resource management. And we very much take that system science or ecology of cities sort of approach to the work that we do. You know, we do study green patches, but sort of all the ways in which people and organizations are also critical connectors between those spaces. You can learn more at our website that's there at the bottom. So for the social assessment, I'm just going to hide some Zoom things so I can see my slides. Um, we had this primary overarching research question. What are the uses, functions, and values of parkland and natural areas as conveyed through people's behaviors, descriptions, and narratives? Um, so why do a social assessment like this? Well, there are, are lots of studies about this kind of use um, in a, a more rural setting. We were actually adapting some old tried and true rural recreation methods that existed, but not so many have been applied systematically in an urban setting. Um, and we also think it's really critical for elucidating cultural ecosystem services. You know, we often talk about the biophysical benefits of urban environments from providing uh, cooling to, you know, supporting biodiversity, but how can we better understand and track those sociocultural services? And then it can be used to answer really site-specific questions, including um, how parks are used in the context of different demographic shifts, shifts or capital investments or disturbances that arrive. It can be used as sort of a baseline that can then be reassessed. Um, and before my tech troubles, I was going to just clarify that we use the term natural areas pretty broadly, but um, the way the Parks Department uses it is to refer to those spaces that are primarily woodlands, wetlands, grasslands, areas that are um, managed for their ecosystem function rather than uh, more landscaped or manicured parks. But we looked at those natural areas in the context of the whole park that surrounded it. So I just mentioned some of these uses, planning, design, design and programming. Um, the Natural Areas Conservancy is a citywide nonprofit that focuses on those 10,000 acres of natural areas, and they really wanted to understand more specifically about the use of those spaces within parks. Um, we've also worked with Prospect Park Alliance, um, with the Harbor Estuary Program in Passaic, New Jersey, um, and with researchers from Pace University at Coney Island Creek. Um, and in each case, you can see there's sort of a different context surrounding why we would want this social information about users, um, but the applications of that data can, can really be endless, just having a systematic way to understand where, how, and why people are using park space. Um, it can also be then integrated with biophysical data sets. So when this was first developed way back in 2013, um, just after Hurricane Sandy, it was done, there was a citywide ecological assessment of um, forests and wetlands, and it was meant to be sort of a companion study, although different in method and scale. The EA was a more plot-based study, and the social assessment takes a whole extensive view of the entire polygon of the park. Um, we've also worked with researchers and practitioners that focus on waterfronts and the use of natural and nature-based features. Uh, so that's with folks at the Science and Resilience Institute at Jamaica Bay and, and others at um, New York State to sort of say, we need rapid protocols for understanding the ways in which these, you know, new features that are being put, it, put in along waterfronts, how we can assess their performance. So this social assessment that you'll hear sort of in its kind of full treatment has been narrowed down to a much simpler protocol that is folded into this New York State um, assessment for natural and nature-based features. 
And I can provide links to all of these after the fact if you want to dig into these various aspects. But for the social assessment itself, so we did uh, 16 parks in 2013, and those were all New York City parks and NPS sites that were adjacent to Jamaica Bay. Um, this was um, post Hurricane Sandy, those parks were heavily affected and folks really wanted to understand, you know, the critical social and biophysical uh, services that those spaces were providing. Then in 2014, we took a citywide sample that had parks of various sizes that contained natural areas of various sizes. And then we did, um, we had initially left out Prospect Park and Central Park because those were sort of better understood and studied and managed. But then at the request of Prospect Park Alliance, we, we did do the study there in 2016. And just quick sort of stats, um, we observed and counted the activities of more than 37,000 park users. We did rapid on-site interviews with over 1,600 people and our intrepid uh, field researchers, you know, pounded the pavement of over 9,500 acres. So this is all um, on-site directly collected social data. So, how do we get these data? Really, really simple methods that anyone can do. And we'll talk at the end about how this could be a training tool that could be used with different types of audiences. But we map, we talk, and we walk. So this is meant to be sort of a complement to those more um, extensive pictures that we might get from remotely sensed imagery or census data about household demographics. These are things that you can only learn from being on the ground um, in place. That said, we do start with maps. Um, this is just a hand-drawn map on top of Canarsie Park, but we wanted our crews to have a way to sort of quickly move through space and find themselves in space. So we started off by subdividing um, all the parks in our sample into these activity zones. So we would take into account roadways and park infrastructure, uh, land cover, and then you know sort of key features or amenities on the landscape so that you could quickly locate yourself um, as you were moving through space, collect data that could then be assigned to those zones and that can all be saved in a GIS and can power some of the maps that you'll see later. There are other methods for doing rapid social data that are more like walking a transect, but we really wanted the ability to sort of aggregate up to these polygons in order to, to make those kinds of maps. Um, so like I said, it's spatially explicit. We covered all the interior space of each park in our sample, and then we walked the edge, making observations there. Um, we had three protocols. We looked at direct human observation. Those are just the counts of activities, what people were doing, whether they were alone or in pairs, in large groups, were they youth, were they seniors? Uh, we looked at signs of human use, so traces people leave in the landscape, and then we conducted randomized interviews. Um, we also did debriefs and kept qualitative field notes, and then um, later on, once we went to Prospect Park, we uh, stacked in Twitter data. So you can really see we, we take seriously the idea of triangulation, that you need these sort of multiple data streams to really understand a place. Um, and that they each provide sort of complementary pictures. So start with the direct human. Um, this is maybe most similar to the recreational studies you've seen sort of with a clicker or maybe standing at an entrance. Um, but once you've gathered those data in this structured protocol, like I said, you can then um, aggregate up to those zones. So this is a Prospect Park example, just pure counts. Where were people found? And darker areas show where there were more people. Um, I should have mentioned we did this all in summer, so sort of one season, kind of peak use, and we would visit each park three times, a weekday, an evening, and a weekend. There's certainly more to be learned about temporal variation. You could, you know, with more time and resources, you could look at all different kinds of um, seasonal change or change over time, but we did this summer snapshot. And then we observed what are they doing, um, whether it was you know, socializing in place or playing basketball or fishing or kind of adapting the landscape to their own uses. We, we counted every single person uh, that we came across. And I thought it would be fun to show the full study pie chart of all 37,000 people um, in our categories. About a third of them were what we called socializing in place. So they weren't using any particular park feature, but they were there um, with a, 
a friend or a small group um, talking and socializing. And I think that can be something we know very intuitively about parks, but to be able to show these are critical gathering spaces for New Yorkers um, that are used every single day. Um, that is a pretty powerful number, I think. But yes, sports and recreation, walking and dog walking, and then some of the less frequent uses, including just sitting alone. You know, as much as they are social spaces, they are also places for refuge and being alone, um, bicycling, nature recreation, and so on. Um, but that's just, you know, the whole citywide picture, all of this can be disaggregated to any park or any zone to take a closer look. So I used um, Van Cortlandt Park as an example here. The map on the left shows all the sports and recreation with dark red being places where there are more folks playing sports. And in right, it's a nature recreation. So darker blue are where we saw more people doing, um, you know, birding or hiking. And one of the reasons why this was important is, you know, we don't want to measure the value of a space only by the number of people. You know, certain spaces are created to accommodate large group, like a like a basketball court, um, and others are spaces where people go to get away and have an experience of refuge or solitude. So, um, being able to sort of tease apart those different uses and where they happen in kind of hot spots, and do they sort of match the park amenities and infrastructures that are on the ground um, starts to give us a slightly more um, nuanced picture there. So that was the first protocol, direct human, you know, counting what people do. Um, but like I said, we were only there three times in each park. So we couldn't always sort of, you know, quote unquote, catch people in the act. Um, we have to read the landscape for evidence of what people were doing, whether that was the birders at dawn or people who were there in the night. And the public really does shape the landscape. These are not only park, you know, government managed spaces. So we looked for, we instructed our crews to take photographs of any sort of changes in the landscape that were above and beyond sort of typical park infrastructure. So that could include cut throughs and informal trails, nature assemblages or memorials, um, informal signage, you know, positive or negative, we said sort of like, you know, remove your own sort of judgment of what you think of these signs and just, you know, document them, photograph, count them, write a field note. Um, so these are uh, some examples of that on this slide. Um, among those many signs, we did find symbols, um, memorial symbols, sacred symbols, offerings, um, art assemblages. Um, and, you know, these are meaningful that some of them are for religious practices some are some of them are for creative expression um, obviously this requires further triangulation with communities that are using those parks to understand and and interpret the meaning and sometimes we might we might never be able to discern who left a particular um, offering or assemblage so uh, we just recognize that this is part of the way that um, park users are not just users but are sort of co-creators or um, they help shape the landscape uh, to ways that have meaning to them. Um, when folks first reached out to me, it was from this particular paper, The Written Park. So we had our crews take pictures of every single piece of text <laughs> or writing or signage or flyer that was in a park. And from that, we could code it and analyze it like you would any other text, like a newspaper article. So across 42 parks, we had 784 uniquely photographed signs and we treated graffiti separately. Um, we coded the messages um, and the speakers in those signs. And then we did um, key informant interviews with expert graffiti writers to help us sort of interpret the graffiti signs themselves. Um, so just from reading signs in the landscape, we can learn a lot about who are the actors sort of influencing the space and what messages are they sending about the space. And I just put them in rank order here. I mean, not surprising that city government, the formal land manager, is putting out most the preponderance of the signs, but it's not only them. Um, we also have civic groups or nonprofits, businesses, individuals, and different layers of government there. Um, the messages, these are from the, the coding of the content, um, like going through them sort of in clusters. A lot of them pertain to public safety 
or reinforcing particular behaviors or activities that can happen in parks, like cautionary signs, construction signs. Um, others talk about the park as a public sphere, um, where really you have sort of a captive local audience. Sometimes that was advertisements or just notices or messages about public programs. You have educational and environmental signs to give context about local ecologies. There were signs related to remembrances or spiritual expression, memorials, and religious statements. And then there were a number of signs that simply demarcated space or offered place names or helped users navigate through wayfinding. So from that coding, we started to think about, you know, what kind of park subjects are being sort of created or called into being from these messages that are in parks. And we came up with these four that we write about extensively in that paper, but the first is really the ideal park subject. This is how a person is supposed to be in parkland. Um, and it's clearly messaged through the official signs of New York City parks. Um, there are messages about parks as a shared public space intended for recreation with an emphasis on safety and cleanliness. There's a prohibition on amplified sound or commercial activities without a permit. Um, you're not allowed to panhandle or rummage through trash receptacles or do illegal drug or alcohol use. There are always clear closing times in the park. You know, the park is meant to be a daytime space, so you're not meant to sleep or inhabit in the space. Um, and you can see the way all these rules that maybe we've sort of internalized as New Yorkers and park users, but they, they set the bounds on what is really acceptable leisure practice or, you know, user behaviors within a space. Um, but that subject is sort of in conversation with the neighbor or the steward. So you have an example here of a community bulletin board on the top. These sorts of community-led signs um, offer other clues of adjacent um, kind of that co-creation or co-management that I was describing. Some of those um, are really supportive of the land manager, like shared programming, cleanup efforts. Others might have a slightly more subtle um, tension about claiming who or what the space is for. Um, that might include going off trail or creating informal seating or fire pits, um, you know, party spots, as managers might call them, or even doing rogue plantings, um, you know, this sort of claiming of place that can happen by adjacent users. Um, graffiti writers, I mentioned, uh, we had these really wonderful interviews with graffiti writers who looked at our, our signs and they said, you know, we see examples of people practicing their craft, seeking notoriety or seeking a place to be left alone. They didn't see evidence of a lot of, you know, um, gang signs or the like. Um, so, you know, officially graffiti is prohibited within New York City parks and often it is removed, but many um, graffiti writers find these, um, you know, more undisturbed locations where they can practice their craft and kind of participate in this collective expression of the graffiti writing community. Um, and the last one that we named free agents um, was really where we saw people seeking out, I mean, refuge, space to be alone, or a quote unquote wilderness experience um, that could be because they need a place to live, um, a place to engage in maybe illicit or covert activities, or it might just be literally having um, a sense of getting away from kind of the hyper-constructed sort of built environment. So, I mean, I don't wanna paint an overly rosy picture. There's definitely examples of, you know, defacement of um, park property or burnt signs or sort of um, counter messaging that happened. And we tried to just sort of um, take that into context. Those, those are also users of the park and they're sending a message about the kinds of activities um, that they're seeking out the site for. And, we have some kind of more detailed ethnographic case studies in the paper of parks where that tension between the ideal park subject and the free agent kind of plays out. So all of that um, sort of unfolds from just reading signs that are in the landscape. Um, finally, uh, the interviews are really critical. We, we did rapid interviews with every third park user to sort of decrease bias. Um, and we ask very basic questions like, what are you doing in the park today and why? Um, how often do you visit? This is just an example from Prospect Park, but we have it for the whole city. 
uh, daily. Um, you know, many of the park users visit these parks on a daily or weekly basis, just providing evidence that these are sort of critical examples of uh, nearby nature that are very important to people's everyday lives. Um, we asked, why do you come to this park? Um, and at left, these are the kind of in rank order, the coded reasons that people gave. I'm starting with it's local, you know, it's my nearby park. Um, and that was really powerful. We found that um, for park users, uh, about half of them that we interviewed, maybe it was 40%, I don't have the exact figure, but they really went nowhere else for their outdoor recreation activities. So again, just reinforcing how important these resources are. Um, but folks also cited particular amenities that drew them to that place, be they built or natural, um, connecting with nature and the outdoors, so tree canopy, uh, waterfronts, Again, that theme of refuge came out, space to be alone, uh, pure enjoyment, whatever that means for people. I come here to have fun, to enjoy myself, to relax. People named specific activities that they can do in parks from you know, boating to horseback riding to mountain biking. Um, people displayed really deep place attachment of having come to parks over decades or having um, generational experiences with place. So we, we saved that code for when people talked about more than just enjoying a place, but having a deep and long lasting tie to it. Um, and then sociability and social ties. We talked about parks as social spaces already, but we can take those themes that came from an open-ended question and kind of see how they map to what the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment says are cultural services. And, you know, all of these categories can get debated, but we, we were able to demonstrate many of these uh, services being provided through parkland. And some of them are more easily detectable with a lot of social science methods. We have many studies that talk about, you know, using photographic methods, uh, aesthetic values, or using um, economic methods to get at recreation and ecotourism. But wow, being able to elicit some of these more subtle spiritual and religious values um, and inspiration. Uh, we, were, we were excited to find those in our interview data sets. And then again, remember that all of this is spatial. So looking at Van Cortlandt Park again, um, now instead of just thinking about people counts, which is the image on the left, darker orange, more people, lighter orange, fewer people. You can think about, well, what percentage of the people that we encountered or interviewed really cited refuge as a critical reason that they're in the park. And that's what's on the dark green, um, the map on the right. So this just gives you a different way to think about uh, the services and meanings and experiences that are happening in a place uh, and how we might value some of those um, more subtle uses that might be harder to harder to get out than just um, through counting alone. Uh, we also asked, because we were interested in natural areas, wherever we were in the park, we'd say, do you ever go in the woods over there? Or do you ever go in that wetland area? And we'd kind of gesture. And folks would tell us, yes, I do, or no, I don't. And if no, we would um, probe on why not. Um, and we kind of coded that into these different categories. So Nancy Santi led this article called Fear and Fascination. And, you know, for some people, it's just their preference. People would say things like, the woods are not for me, or I don't want to go in there. I don't like the woods. It doesn't interest me. It has nothing to offer. Um, others gave ambiguous answers. They, maybe they weren't even aware that there were forests or wetlands adjacent to where they were. Um, others gave really specific barriers. Um, physical disabilities, age, um, concerns around safety were certainly named. And so um, again, if, if one of the goals of the Natural Areas Conservancy is to connect more people to these nature experiences within New York City parks, we need to understand not only physical access, like you know, making sure um, parks are equitably distributed and have public transportation, but also you know, programmatic access and what's going to overcome some of these uh, mental barriers that folks might have. Um, we looked at those differences by gender and found that women were significantly less likely uh, to say they go in natural areas than men. And definitely, you know, stories of gendered violence would persist over time. Um, 
stories of crime would remain. Like we would hear people talking about parks where they didn't feel safe, um, even though something had happened um, decades ago. And so there are some quotes here from some of our respondents about um, concerns or drivers for why they would want to go in the natural areas. Um, but we found that while women are less likely to visit natural areas, they are more likely to be volunteer environmental stewards. We know that from prior work. And so we think this provides an opportunity for women and families to experience natural areas through stewardship activities that can then build comfort, confidence, and emotional attachment to wild spaces. Um, so we think that provides a really important programmatic inroad, and there certainly are many robust stewardship programs offered by New York City Parks, but the various conservancies and friends of groups that are doing really important work of lessening those barriers for folks. Um, we also asked if people are involved in those kinds of groups, those groups that help take care of the environment, um, and most were not, which is, you know, not unexpected, um, you know, this is a volunteer sort of leisure practice of civic environmentalism, but the slice of this pie that sort of interested us a lot also was the no but. Um, again, this is an example from Prospect Park, but it could be anywhere. Toggling back to um, citywide, we took those no buts and we coded all the reasons people gave us why they didn't participate um, in environmental stewardship and what other forms of engagement they participated in. Um, so the cluster that's at the top in green are folks who said, well, I don't do stewardship, but you know, I'm involved, or I don't do civic stewardship, but I'm involved through my work. You know, I work for the Department of Environmental Protection or the EPA, or I'm not a part of a group, but I always bag my trash and I clean up after myself and my fishing lines, or the environment's not my thing, but I'm really involved with my church or I have these kinds of pro-environmental behaviors that I do at home on my own time, whether it's recycling or other kinds of practices. And so those are all folks who are maybe really proximate to possible potential stewards. Then you have the folks in the middle um, in blue who sort of said, um, oh, I used to, but I don't anymore. Or they were sort of self-critical, gosh, I should, I feel guilty. All the way to people who said, I have no idea that that was even something I could be involved in. Um, so those are folks that might um, need a little more outreach or information or opportunities for getting involved. And then there are others who just said, you know, I have physical barriers, life course, those kinds of things that are immovable, or I just simply don't have time. And just recognizing that not everyone's in the same place in their, in their life course, um, in their ability to volunteer, but being able to kind of tease apart um, folks' readiness or interest or desire to engage. Um, I think these are helpful nuance beyond just the engaged, the non-engaged. Um, <clears throat> I'm wrapping up soon, so you can have some time for discussion, but I mentioned um, Twitter, you know, all this data was collected on the ground, but how could we triangulate it with things that people are saying um, in social media? Um, and so for Prospect Park, we grabbed all the tweets that um, were geo-referenced within the Prospect Park boundary or that used, you know, the handle or hashtag Prospect Park. And um, we did a similar sort of manual coding process to what we did with the um, physical signs we detected in the site. So we were able to code those for aesthetic values, recreation, spiritual values, and social relations, and then similarly tease that apart by space. And that's work that my colleague, Michelle Johnson led. So as more and more of these kinds of big data and social media enabled approaches are happening in social science, it's helpful to be able to compare and contrast them with these um, on the ground types of data sets as well. So um, this is that category of refuge uh, emerging for Prospect Park the social space, darker colors always indicate um, more folks talking about it. Um, lastly, in the interviews, we asked, where else do you go um, for outdoor experiences? And that's where that stat I gave you about folks who go nowhere else came from. Um, but we looked at where were we folks interviewed and where did they go? And sometimes there were linkages, you know, people liked waterfront sites and beaches, but 
what really interested us is once we started to get beyond the bounds of New York City and we realized, you know, in our global city, um, you know, people are sort of the pollinators. They were relating their experiences in New York City natural areas to experiences they'd had um, in the Caribbean, in South America, in the West. And not saying that these are interchangeable, but that people were carrying the memories of places that they had visited, um, experience they'd had, and often those were some of the features or reasons that they were drawn to uh, a walk, a view shed, a fishing experience, a social experience. So um, it's helpful that we're managing these places as, you know, local assets, but understanding that we have really a global community of users who um, expect and hope for different kinds of experiences in their, in their parks and natural areas. Um, I mentioned this as a training tool or as a way of seeing, um, and I really firmly believe that, you know, it's, it's a rich, rich data set, but as much, um, it's a process. And um, once you're sort of trained in these three protocols of observing people, um, counting and coding signs and conducting interviews, you really do start to understand these landscapes as uh, social ecological. Um, you almost kind of can't can't turn it off. Um, but so we've trained everyone from high school students to uh, workforce trainees, um, job corps participants, um, and we're really excited about continuing to refine this tool and making it more of a you know, curriculum or training tool or community science tool. So I, I come back to my remarks uh, at the beginning of the hour about Ecoflora and how you all are, um, you know, keen community observers. I know that apps like iNaturalist make it easy and we don't have something streamlined like an app like that yet, but just imagining if you had a kind of easily downloadable protocol for observing and collecting social data about your, your favorite park, what would that what would that look like? How would that change your way of uh, reading or seeing the landscape? And I mentioned, um, you know, New York City Parks, my colleague Nova Mao Young and Georgina Coleman, they've, they've used this protocol um, in kind of a rapid form to go in and say, all right, a capital design is coming or some sort of investment in the wetland. Let's, let's better understand the social uses that are happening there before we sort of propose some kind of design. Um, I think it gives you a, a very different picture from maybe when folks show up to a community meeting. Um, again, to the point of triangulation, I think they're useful in concert. People might come to a community meeting to make requests or participate in a charrette or say something that they want to see in the future in a space. And that's really important to have that procedural voice. But I think it's also important to sort of take the temperature of what's happening right now in real time on the ground in a space. Um, so if I sum all that up, all of those protocols, all of those papers, I mean, I really come back to that parkland and natural areas in New York City are providing um, psychosocial and spiritual benefits um, that are important to understand and take into account. Um, and when I say uh, the psycho is about connecting with self, mm -hmm. the social is about connecting with others, and spiritual and the broadest understanding might be about connecting with a larger reality. And I think from our uh, triangulating across the interviews um, and the observations, um, all of these themes have come out, and I hope I've pointed to that uh, throughout the talk, um, that people are going to these places to get away, to experience refuge, or to engage in self-expression but they're also going to be in the company of others. And then sometimes they're doing it to engage in really explicitly spiritual or religious practices. So we have many, many lessons learned, but I'll sum up just a few. Um, obviously, um, parks are heterogeneous, you know, in their shape, size, structure, management, and ecology, you know, from those programmed recreation areas to um, very narrow sort of linear parks to expansive natural areas. Um, parks can be democratic, but they can also be contentious. You know, people have different expectations and perceptions and values about who or what parks should be for. Um, and, you know, let's not shy away from that contention. Maybe it's a space to lean into and try and better understand and unpack um, for park managers. <clears throat> 
Well, we also one of our crew members uh, said people have mad love for parks just you know it, it was really a, a joy to collect these data and read the debrief notes that how much um, love and care people have for these spaces whether it's the form of you know formal civic groups or individual stewardship or people sort of you know tending plants on the edges um, people really feel ownership and connection to these spaces um, there's also an informal parks economy and you know all of this was done <laughs> i should have said at the outset before the COVID-19 pandemic where, you know, this just sort of need to have space to do sort of everything in our public lives. But even then we um, observed caregivers, dog walkers, um, outdoor classes, camps, you know, um, these are not just uh, recreational spaces. People are making livelihoods um, in these parks. So they're doing a lot of work. Um, and the public does engineer, you know, as much as parks has the official um, management jurisdiction for these spaces, people uh, shape the space as well through their desire lines, through shaping bike ramps, um, to graffiti, to constructing art assemblages. Um, and I mentioned several times um, the importance of nearby nature, but also everyday ecology. We found people having deep uh, local ecological knowledge people would <laughs> sometimes these rapid interviews would turn into long interviews where people would tell us about horseshoe crabs or favorite birds or um you know patterns that they had observed um and we've already talked about parks as refuge so i hope that um this has given you sort of a walkthrough of this method and some of our findings i have links to all of the papers at the end of the talk that I can share around. And um, I thank you for your attention. I think we have some time for discussion. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, I did link uh, one or two of those papers um, in the chat um, at some point. But um, if anybody's interested, um, just let us know if there's any ones that, that were not there. Um, so feel free if you have questions. I know we already have some questions in the, in the chat. Um, or if you want to add any more. Uh, one thing that I was thinking about with this is, I think probably a lot of non-New Yorkers or maybe even New Yorkers think about um, Central Park a lot as kind of the main park, but that was not one that was included in this because it's kind of looking at a different sort of space. Uh, I imagine that it's probably very similar act like breakdown of activities there, uh, but it's, you know, there's so many other, uh, not like, uh, well, I guess maybe you can't even really call that a natural space in some sense, uh, but that we have so much uh, land that it's great that people are using it and having a connection to it. Yeah, I mean, on one hand, you know, it, it was a tough choice to not do Central Park. It would have been nice to have that as sort of a reference or comparison site in the study, but you know, with with limited resource and field staff, we focused on other places. There had been some studies, uh, the sort of clicker type studies that um, Central Parks Conservancy had funded um, earlier. Uh, I forget the year, so we felt like they had a little bit of a handle um, on their on their user base, but. Um, we are talking with the Parks Department and the NAC about possible remeasurement or a restudy and what would that citywide sample look like? You know, there's no reason we had to exclude Central Park, but I have used Central Park to do trainings like with CUNY students and for example, and I would always go in sort of uh, skeptical, like, oh, it's so manicured, it's so maintained, we're not going to find like any signs. But, you know, once you're sort of trained in the method, like I said, you learn to look at the back of lamp posts or pay attention to um, footpaths. Like, there are subtle ways in which users sort of shape that space as well. Um, so, it really is a way of seeing. And obviously, there's more sort of natural areas like the North Woods within Central Park as well. So, we very well could have studied that that space. I see, Daniel, you have your hand raised. If you would like to uh, ask, go ahead and unmute yourself. You can. Thanks. Um, hey, Lindsay, uh, I, uh, I also put this in the chat, but I, uh, I work for the Parks Department as an urban park ranger uh, currently in the Bronx. And uh, I thought the Van Cortland uh, 
data and the way it was presented was really interesting and it does show how the management of the park um, can be altered but also how it's working in, some, in lots of cases but my question was did you consider or were they included in park users of parks staff and I think it's an important part uh, we teach a lot of our lessons are place-based and we include people uh, people in place and parks big P parks meaning the manager the people that manage the park so yeah. yeah, my question is staff, was staff included or could it be? Yeah, for the um, observations, we had a category just for working. And so that could include anyone like a park worker, but it also included vendors. So we did count folks who were formally working. We did have a separate category for um, educational tours, like so when we would notice large groups or, you know, um, we always counted individuals, pairs, small groups, and large groups. And then we could compare that with the activities and educational tours was one of them. But we did kind of informal interviews with a handful of park managers about, you know, kind of validating our findings and checking in on some of the inquiries that were emerging, but we didn't do like a systematic interview protocol with park managers. I think it's one of the pieces that sort of got cut in the implementation. And I think it adds a, like huge asset like when we did Inwood Park we had a special um, kind of grant for that where we did four seasons we actually started with a focus group with park managers and kind of did a quick rough and ready version of those zones and said like here are some hot spots here are some issue areas you know like park managers and the folks on the ground like really know those spaces like very well um, so I think if I were to do it again um, I would probably want to structure some either pre or post uh, engagement with the on the ground managers for sure. Um, they have a lot of insights. And speaking of, we did have a comment here um, from Joy about other on the ground educators that give tours or workshops in the parks on a regular basis. And one of those is the um, urban park rangers and other kinds of uh, people that are in parks. There are, it's, it's the website can be a little bit hard to, to wade through because there's so many events, but if you go on the NYC Parks website, um, they, they have tons and tons of um, activities that are going on during the week, on the weekends, um, that are really awesome to get involved in. Yeah, Urban Park Rangers and then, you know, the New York City Park Stewardship Team is the one responsible for a lot of the um, hands-on kinds of activities, which can happen, you know, not only in parks, they also have a whole street tree um, stewardship team. And then, you know, not every park has a friends of group or a conservancy, but many do. And those add additional um, programming and opportunities for the public to get engaged. So I would always look for what, what is parks doing and what are some of the nonprofits and community-based groups adjacent sort of doing as well. So we got another uh, question here from Evan. Uh, did you notice any differences between the parks uh, that are in different socioeconomic settings or backgrounds? Well, um, you know, the, the sample, you know, the natural, the large parks that have large natural areas, they're not like evenly distributed across um, space in New York City. More of them are, um, outer borough kind of further towards the margins of, of the city. So I'm always sort of cautious about saying like, what, what is the, it's not the same as a study of neighborhood pocket parks that might be sort of everywhere. Um, and the sample that we pulled citywide was not meant to sort of stratify by neighborhood demographics or anything like that. We were really just looking at park size. We wanted large and small parks and what percentage of it is natural area. So I'm just cautious about um, over extrapolating. Um, another sort of limitation of the early social assessment was we really didn't collect hardly any demographic data, just um, course age categories and uh, gender. And we realized you know, that helped with speed but it didn't answer a lot of questions about park users themselves that we wanted to understand. So when we did Prospect Park, um, 
we used a tablet to ask census style demographic questions of our interviewees after we did the rapid interviews because uh, that's been shown to work better than asking someone verbally to tell you, you know, their income, their educational status, their gender. You just did the rapid interview, tried to establish rapport, talked about what they were doing in the park, and then let them fill out the tablet. Um, and so I think in any re-measurement, we would, we would do something like that again. Um, so I'm, I'm sure I, when you're designing things like this too, it's like impossible to know from the get-go, like what you want to <laughs> exactly get. And then sometimes it's too late. Well, that was the point with Prospect Park. When they came to us, it was really part of their research question from the outset. They said, we know our neighbor, you know, our neighborhood is changing, is transforming. We want to understand, are we serving sort of everyone? Do we have like an east-west divide within Prospect Park? Like who are the users in these different spaces? So you know, this is very applied research and that that interest or question like came from the manager themselves. Um, and so that was important to us. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not trying, I'm thinking if I have anything more to say about socioeconomic like context. You know, the other thing to know is while lots of people use their nearby parks and say, I only go here or I go here every day, there are also people that say, I traveled across the city to have this nature experience. You know, I got on the train or the subway or the bus to go only here. So again, the, the Pelham Bay is the Inwood parks. Like some of these are, are parks that are serving a whole sort of citywide or even region-wide user base. So it's tough to sort of say like, what are the socio-demographics of that park when it's sort of serving a citywide user base? So I think the better we can understand the users themselves, um, then we could make comparisons maybe to demographics at the citywide level. Um, probably the parks that had like the lowest level of use, just period, would be uh, small parks that had very, very large natural areas that were in a condition where they were almost unnavigable, like, um, you know, a totally overgrown violin without available trails. Um, and these are the sites that Natural Areas Conservancy and the Parks Department is, is very focused on, you know, trying to restore and, and is, it's quite well, it's on their radar screen that this is an issue, you know, sort of assets that they're holding, but they're not able to sort of fully use them. So the whole trails team from NAC has um, developed since the time of this um, study uh, in terms, just in terms of mapping the trail system, formalizing the trail system, adding blazes, like simple sort of basics that you, you might think that we that we have citywide, but really we don't. Um, so there's there's a ton that can be done to help both with physical access, like I was saying, trail systems, entry points, but also programmatic access multilingual um, outreach. Um, I want to give a shout out. The park stewardship team has a green communities program where they really try and target um, underserved communities where they've historically had lower engagement. So I do think this um, equity mindset is, is really top of mind for parks and NAC of wanting these resources to be used and accessed by all New Yorkers. Oh yeah, and I see Maritza putting in the comments about people traveling to use the green belt. Yeah. Um, okay, so speaking on sort of what you were just talking about, changing um, paths through <clears throat> non-navigatable parts of the um, parks, we have a little bit further up in the chat, Karen Rendell asked, are there specific examples on how the study caused you to alter the landscape in the park? Um, so it sounds like you already have some sort of ideas about how you might use this data to inspire or work on some changes within the parks, but are there any more or any that you personally envision? Yeah, thanks. I feel like this work, I've worked for my whole career here at the field station, and it really does feel this, like this iterative cycle of adaptive management. You know, it's not like uh, do study, walk away, make change, but it's this kind of long-term relationship that we have with parks and also NAC um, about this way of seeing. I think NAC uses a lot of the social data 
um, in advocacy and in outreach, like just to sort of help people understand that these natural areas are there, that they're important, that they're assets, that they're used, you know, so um, NEC is a powerful communicator with, with the press and being able to have uh, reliable data is really important. But um, I talked about Georgina and Novum and their team sort of using this rapid assessment before a capital investment. Um, and that's happening in, um, well, I don't want to cite the wrong site, but I think it's Powell's Cove in Queens. Um, they went in, they, they did a social assessment, and they used that to help inform what otherwise might have just been a straight sort of wetlands like capital project. So I think, um, you know, the more park staff are trained up in this method, the more they can take it into account in um, design and programming as well. Um, and then I think, yeah, I mentioned the trails team that NAC and parks have put into place. Um, and they've really, you know, the ecological assessment has, has also been operationalized into how they do uh, site selection for forest restoration work. That's a whole other talk that you should have from Christy King and, and, and her team at Parks, but um, they did sort of a threat health matrix on uh, the condition of forests, as well as the level of threat, and that helps them sort of guide uh, targeted decision-making about sort of where to restore and where to leave um, forests sort of to do their, to do their thing. Um, And um, yeah, I, I mentioned earlier some of the other waterfront parks. Um, this is not not us using it, but we, you know we did the Coney Island study, and advocates um, took those data and used them to help um, talk about some of the sociocultural values of the space um, when they were kind of saying we don't think that the New York City ferry should be located here. Um, so that was another sort of use of that data. Um, the Passaic work we did in New Jersey was also used in concert with a physical redesign for them helping to think about what kinds of on water and adjacent to water programming would be well received. So um, there are lots of potential applications and real ones at the site level or sort of citywide. Um, related again to what you are basically talking about right now, Bill asks, um, what do you see as the usage of this data for budget and project prioritization? Hmm. Yeah, I think that's been really, really well done with the, the ecological data, kind of being able to boil it down to this matrix and we haven't gone that as far as that with the social data, but it's something we're talking about in the remeasurement. Like, um, okay, parks of similar condition, what level of uh, and size, sort of what level of use do they have? What types of stewardship opportunities do they have? I mean, I, I don't have this uh, decision support tool all built, but we are um, talking about that. Um, I think locally, it, it I, I've presented a lot of aggregate data. Each of these are written up as park profiles as well. So if you have a conservancy or a friends of group or sort of local neighbors that really just want to say, show me the park profile for Marine Park, it becomes a way of talking about the social value of your space that's, um, I guess, uh, reliable and credible in addition to sort of like heartfelt appeals that people have about why the park matters to them. Um, it's another sort of data layer to say, we're serving this many people, we're providing these services, people come every day. So it definitely um, can be used in an advocacy vein. You know, I'm a federal scientist, advocacy is not my job, but if folks wanna take it and use it that way, like they certainly can. Um, and that's very great. That kind of data is so important to have because if you know that people are visiting the park, but you then have these like the numbers and the, the hard facts, it, it, you know, can play, you know, you have both ends going. You have the emotional appeal and also the logical thing working together. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Awesome. Uh, Maritza, I saw you had your hand up before. I don't know if you still have a question that you wanted to ask. Um, 
No, I, I just wanted to share with those individuals that are not familiar with New York City and in the environmental education um, that happens here, there's a lot that goes on in New York City. I mean, we just mentioned a couple of things. I'm a former urban park ranger, though I run the um, environmental education department in the Greenbelt. But um, aside from the urban park rangers, there are tons of nonprofits that use our parks for environmental education, for cultural, um, historical tours. Uh, so it, you just have to spend some time researching who's doing what. Uh, in, in the city, in, in all five boroughs, really. So there's a lot going on. I know that I think it was Joy who asked, and many of them are free. Some of them, if it's a nonprofit, there's a nominal fee to, to do a program. But there's kids in our parks learning every single day now that you know they're allowed to do field trips again, you know, post COVID. Thank you. Well, I, I saw one question in the chat I didn't address about um, youth, which is mm -hmm. one limitation of the interviews because of our, um, you know, just human subjects, like we don't interview people under 18. So we don't have interviews with youth. We just have the observations of what they were doing. But um, we certainly would talk to caregivers um, and parents and um, they would often share the perspective of why they were in the park if they were there with their kids or even if they weren't there at the time people would share stories of their kids being the ones that led them to this particular park for example so yeah one limit limitation didn't in dinner interview youth yeah and uh we have lorelei here asking about are there uh programs that are meant specifically for tourists i would say there's a lot of stuff that happens in central park they do a lot of birding walks and different kinds of plant walks. So like if you were visiting and you weren't able to get, let's say to go to the Bronx or to go to Staten Island, they do have a lot of um, stuff happening in Manhattan as well. Even if they don't have like a, you know, whole forest there, they do have a lot of, a lot of stuff going on. Uh, Pearl, if you wanna unmute yourself, you can go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> I would just like to get information on the, what is it, a nature walk in Ali Point Park this Sunday? Oh, yes. So that's going to be um, on Sunday at it's going to start at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, we're putting together right now the the email with all the information with the um, marketing department. So that should go out tomorrow. Um, if you're on our mailing list already, you'll get that email. But if not, I can post again the link to sign up for that so that you'll be able to get more information about that. Thank you. And actually, we have one more uh, comment that was up a little bit higher. That's an interesting uh, kind of comment um, about people that don't go visit the parks. How do you engage the people that don't visit the parks? And I guess that's a whole chunk of people that aren't represented in the study because they weren't there. Um, so that would be kind of an interesting, I guess, like a compliment kind of like, why do they not come? And there'd probably be some similar answers, like people said why they, like they're too busy, they don't, they don't know all this kind of stuff, but that is. You all, you all are, I, I want you all in my social assessment remeasurement meetings. Yes, we are talking about this. Um, you, know, you can only study who's there. Uh, it's a park user study, um, but it would be complemented by, you know, like a, a citywide survey, for example, a randomized general population survey. Um, and that's definitely something we've we've thought about. We're not implementing it right now, but uh, my other big research project is called StuMap, and it's a study of civic environmental groups. So those kinds of nonprofits, like Mauricio is naming, and it's a citywide database. And we always get that question, but what about the non-engaged? You know, um, it's it's just sort of the other side of the coin um, would be to do some of those general population surveys. I did do work like that. Um, uh, we did a Population, general population survey in Staten Island in concert with the folks involved with the Fresh Kills landfill transformation because um, they felt like they were hearing a lot from folks in public meetings. They wanted to better understand um, folks across the island citywide. So, you know, we did sort of three band, three distance bands from that park and did um, an island wide survey. And there's a bunch of articles like that. Um, we just haven't done it New York City wide yet, but 
definitely would yield a lot of rich information about both who is using the park and also what barriers they experience and how that varies um, by neighborhood and any number of categories of interest. There's always, always more that can be done, uh, but it's very exciting. Um, oh, sorry, my cat is biting me. Excuse me, sir. Well, uh, if anyone has any last minute questions, like uh, feel free to throw them in there. Um, but otherwise, um, Lindsay, thank you so much again for giving the talk. Uh, we will have the recording posted on YouTube soon if you want to uh, watch again or share. Uh, we've got some of those links to the the full uh, the full like write up about uh, the study that that they did um, up there. Uh, I'm sure if you also you can search uh, for for more information online. If you look up Lindsay, if you look up the um, the New York Urban Field Station, all that kind of stuff. So, but yeah, I that, can pull together yeah. all those links if you want them and just send them to you in one go if if that's helpful or send you my slides as a pdf however whatever folks want yeah that would be great if you could if you send the links we could always include them in our next our next email that we send out great so uh everyone have a great have a great night have a, a great rest of your week maybe we'll see you on sunday or we'll see you at our next talk uh, in the meantime stay well <laughs>